The last thing that we talked about was hybridization of valence bond theory. So valence bond theory was the idea of the atomic orbitals overlapping and sharing the electrons between the two overlapped orbitals. And then we hybridized it to be able to explain things like how can carbon make four bonds and why are those bonds at 109.5 degree angles instead of 90 degree angles? How can you have more than four bonds? and how you can hybridize and bond into those unfilled d orbitals and expand your octet. So let's just real quick review that by describing the hybridization in this molecule, BRF5. So I want to describe the hybridization in BRF5. Just like when we were doing stoichiometry problems, before we could do anything else, we need to start with a balanced reaction. Here, before we can do anything else about describing the bonding, we need to start with a general idea of what this molecule looks like. So what's the quickest and easiest way of drawing a molecule? What theory draws out molecules relatively quickly? Lewis structure. So we're going to draw the Lewis structure. So Lewis dot structure, what's going to go in the middle, bromine or fluorine? Bromine. Four. We'll just put them back there. Fluorine. Is that all I do for Lewis structures? No. What do I still need to do? Valence electrons. So what do I do next? Add them all up. Good. Bromine gives me how many? Good. It's in group seven, so it gives me seven plus five times how many does fluorine give me? Seven as well. So that's how many? Two. Good. That was the second step of drawing the Lewis structures. What's the third step of drawing Lewis structures? Good. Subtract for the bonds I already made in my skeleton. So how many have I already used up? Ten. Good. Each bond is two, so I've already used up ten. So now I'm down to 32 electrons. What am I going to do with them? Put around fluorine. So each fluorine wants an octet and only has two, so they need six more or three lone pairs. So if I have five fluorines and each one of them gets six electrons, how many did I just spend? 30. Now I've got two electrons left over. What should I do with those two? Go on bromine. Got any left over? You go on bromine. Does this obey the octet rule? No, it does not. Bromine has how many electrons around it? 12. So it's an expanded octet. That's okay. Just make sure that you are able to recognize when things do not obey the octet rule. So there's the Lewis structure. Now we're going to describe this bonding using Vesper structure real quick. So Vesper structure, first of all, we need to know how many electron domains are here. How many electron domains are in this structure? Six. Good. I've got five bonds and then that lone pair there, so that's six electron domains. So what is the electron domain geometry? Octahedral. Good. But what is the molecular geometry? Bless you. What's the molecular geometry? Is it still octahedral? And what kind of cases are they going to be different? when what is present causes them to be different. Lone pairs on the central atom. Do I have lone pairs in my central atom? 
Yes, I do. There's a lone pair right there. So they are going to be different. So what molecular geometry starts octahedral but has one lone pair? Square planar. Square planar. Good. So what is the ideal bond angle going to be here? Is the bond angle determined by the molecular geometry or the electron domain geometry? Which one determines the bond angle? I want to know, what is this bond angle here? Ninety. Good. Octahedral is the electron domain geometry. Electron domain geometry is what determines the bond angle. So the ideal bond angle is 90 degrees. Now, is this one going to deviate, or is it going to stay at 90? It's going to deviate. Why? Because there's a lone pair there. Lone pairs take up more room. So does that end up being greater than 90 or less than 90? Less than 90 degrees. And sure enough, if we measure the bond angle in this molecule, we end up with a bond angle of 84.5, so something less than 90 degrees. So these are all kinds of questions you need to be able to answer about a molecule. If I just gave you the formula, be able to draw the Lewis structure, be able to tell me how many electron domains are there, determine the electron domain geometry and molecular geometry, determine what the bond angle is going to be, not just what it ideally should be, but also if it's going to deviate, tell me if it's greater than or less than. So that was all the stuff that we covered last time, except for hybrid theory. So hybrid theory tells us what's actually going on to these atomic orbitals to allow us to have these bonds. So bromine is our central atom. Bromine has how many valence electrons? Seven. So what orbitals, atomic orbitals, look at bromine on the periodic table, it's number 35 up there. What atomic orbitals have its seven valence electrons? Good, 4s and 4p. So 4s and 4p. So if I were to draw my valence electrons in there, I would have two in the 4s and one, two, three, four, five in the 4p. So it looks like bromine can only make one bond. And if this was fluorine, it would be true that it can only make one bond because there's only one singly occupied orbital here. There's only the one right there. It looks like it can only bond there. And for fluorine, that would be the case. It can only bond to one thing. But what is the big distinction between fluorine and bromine, chlorine, iodine, that means that chlorine, bromine, and iodine can bond to more than one thing. Good. They have this D sublevel because they're third period or below. They have the D sublevels. They're sitting there empty, but they're technically there. So. Draw those for D. So in hybrid theory, there's two steps we talked about. Step one, promote electrons until you have as many half-filled orbitals as you have bonds. And, number, or sorry, and then number two is hybridize as many orbitals as you have electron domains. Now in this case, I have six electron domains, but how many bonds? How many bonds are on fluorine? 
five bonds. I'll make a note of that up here. Five bonds. Five bonds, which means I'm going to need five half-filled electrons here, or half-filled orbitals, but six electron domains, so I'm going to need to hybridize six of them. So when I go to, to promote these things, first of all, to make, I'm going to make bromine star, which means excited. I'm going to take this electron, bump it up. This one, bump it up. That one, bump it up. And I'll end up with something that looks like this. Now my 4S has just one of them. 4P. One, no, oh, it's a deep black. One, two, three, four, five. Actually, I don't need to keep on promoting that far because I can leave one of these electrons here and still end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There. I can leave a pair in the 4S. Why did I not have to promote all of them? There's a lone pair, good. This lone pair right here is going to end up being that lone pair, which is why we only needed five bonds. We only needed five singly occupied orbitals. So there's our five singly occupied orbitals. What's our next step? Step one was to promote until you have as many half-filled orbitals as you have bonds, and we've done that. What's the next step? Do I what? Just the S and P's? How many do I need to do? All of the ones that have any electrons? Because I need six. I need six electron domains, which means I need six hybrid orbitals. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six. That's how many I need to hybridize, because I need as many hybrid orbitals as I have electron domains. Add this up here. So when I hybridize those, how many orbitals am I going to get out here? Six. The number of orbitals that goes in is equal to the number of orbitals that goes out. So I should end up with six orbitals. And then I still have those 4Ds over there. They're still sitting there, those three 4D orbitals. They're still sitting there. They're just now empty. When I go to fill in my electrons, I'm just going to carry them down exactly like they were. So two in that first. One, two, three, four, five. Now what would I call? What kind of hybrid orbital is this? What would I call it? S, P3, what? D2. SP3, D2, because it came from an S. It came from one, two, three Ps and one, two Ds. So SP3, D2. Three. So that was all the stuff that we covered last class.
So in this case, this is a great example of when the number of electrons you promoted and the number of, of uh, uh, hybrid orbitals did not end up being the same number because we had a lone pair. Let's look at another example of this. Let's look at formaldehyde. We talked about this structure a little bit last time. This is formaldehyde. It's got a trigonal planar structure, which means that its ideal bond angle is 120. In this case, it's going to vary a little bit because, of course, that double bond takes up more room. So the top two bond angles are going to be slightly greater than 120, and the bottom one is going to be slightly less. So if I want to describe the hybridization state here, so we'd start again by drawing out our atomic orbitals. For what element am I going to draw the atomic orbitals for? C. Good. Always do it for the center atom. So for carbon, how many valence electrons does it have? Four. And they are in what orbitals? Good. 2s has how many? Two. And then 2p has how many? If I have a total of four and I've already used two, I need two. You guys aren't sounding so confident right now. <laughs> Told you there weren't any calculations in chapter nine, but you do have to count. So right now it looks like I can only make two bonds, but how many bonds are coming out of carbon? Four. There are four bonds. How many electron domains? Three electron domains. So just like in the last example, we don't have the same number of bonds as electron domains, which means the number of electrons that we promote, and the hybrid orbitals is not going to end up being the same number again. But now we're switched. In the last example, we had more electron domains than we had bonds. Now we've swapped. Now we have more bonds than electron domains. So let's see what's going to happen here. So what's the first step? Step number one. Promote. So we're going to promote until we have as many half-filled orbitals as we have bonds. We have four bonds. So we're going to take this electron and just promote him. I'll draw this off to the side. That's now C star or C at a higher energy level, no longer at the ground state. Now I've just got one in that 2s, and my 2p has one apiece. All right. So that was step one. Now step two is to hybridize as many as we have electron domains. So how many am I going to hybridize? Three. I've got four up there, but I'm only going to hybridize three because I only have three electron domains. So I'm going to take the first three and hybridize them only. So now it looks like this. I've got three hybrid orbitals. Now, what would I call these hybrid orbitals? S what? Good. SP2 because it came from an S and two Ps. Each one of them have one electron. But I still have a normal 2p orbital over here sitting there with one electron. Now the reason why we do this again is to describe the bond angles. These sp2 orbitals, there's three of them, so they form a trigonal planar with about a 120 degree bond angle. But Right here, if I want to describe, okay, what's bonding in here? Let's say I have uh, this first hydrogen bonds in right there. This second hydrogen bonds in right there. The oxygen bonds in right there. But wait, there's two bonds to the oxygen. So the oxygen is going to bond to one of the hybrids, and it's going to bond also to the unhybridized orbital. So this is hybridization in when you have multiple bonds. So we're in section 9.5, if you're following along in the textbook, that's page 393. Hybridization in molecules containing multiple bonds. Yes? It starts on page 393. So in this case, 
The bonds of the hydrogen would bo both go to an sp2 orbital. Oxygen would have one bond into one of those hybrid orbitals and one bond into the unhybridized orbital. So at this point, my drawing skills aren't going to be able to cut it anymore. Let's watch, switch over to the PowerPoint so you can see the way they draw these things. Okay, so this example is acetylene has got two carbons. Now, in this case, it's asking us to describe the, the hybridization in carbon. It doesn't matter if you're talking about that first carbon or the second carbon because if you look at this, it's a mirror image, so both of these carbons are doing the exact same thing. So when they say this is what's happened to carbon, pick whichever carbon. It doesn't really matter which one you're picking. Same thing. If you look at this from the side, just take this side and replace it with an oxygen, we basically have formaldehyde, the one we just looked at. So they're doing the same thing. So we already talked about we're going to promote so that we have four half-filled orbitals because we know this carbon is going to have one, two, three, four bonds. But this carbon only has three electron domains, just like our example. So we're going to hybridize just three of them here. So now we have the three hybrid orbitals. Three hybrid orbitals means it takes on the trigonal planar shape because it's the same as three electron domains. And then we've got this unhybridized 2p over here, same as the last example. So what's going to happen here? First of all, we're going to come in to the carbon. There's our green ones, again, are the hybrid orbitals. I've got three hybrid orbitals around each carbon. So I've got hydrogen, hydrogen, and then the other carbon in our example, that would be the oxygen. But I've still got this unhybridized 2p orbital. Remember, when they're shown transparent, that means they're half filled. There's only one electron in there. So they're half filled right now, transparent. There is, you can't have two bonds occupying the same place at the same time. There's just not enough room and electrons hate each other too much, which is why it seems like from Lewis structure that double bonds and triple bonds are kind of an oxymoron because you can't have two bonds in the exact same place at the same time. So what actually happens is we're going to have that first bond right here. This one's going to be called on the axis. The second one, and we're going to call that a sigma bond. It doesn't say it right here, but we'll add in that word. Sigma, by the way, the symbol for sigma, I don't know, that's a sigma, lowercase sigma. sigma. So the bond that occurs on the axis, so what I mean by axis is if you picture these two carbons were things on a shish kebab and I put the shish kebab straight through them, that's the axis. There, there's the bond axis. So the bond that occurs on the axis is called a sigma bond. Now these unhybridized P orbitals here are going to expand and try and touch each other. Now, of course, this is just one orbital. It just has two lobes. As they expand, they're going to reach over and expand and reach over and touch the other one to the point where they're on an overlap. When they overlap, that's the definition of coronal valence bond theory of a bond, is overlapped orbitals. So once they overlap, they form this thing called a pi bond. A pi bond is an bond that occurs outside of the axis. In this case, it's going to occur above and below. And that's still just one bond. It's just because it was made from p orbitals and they have two lobes. So it looks like two lobes. So that is a pi bond. Sigma bonds occur on the axis, and pi bonds occur outside of the axis. The same thing was going to happen in a triple bond. Let's get that over. No, they didn't. So here's an example of a triple bond between two carbons. So there's the. I didn't show here. A triple bond here. We're going to end up having a pi bond that is in front of and behind the axis and another one that is on top of and bottom. Now this is just showing two bonds here. Again, each bond has two lobes because it came from p orbitals which have two lobes. So that's what you would see in a triple bond. So what it comes down to here, the general idea is that you have in any bond, the very first bond that forms is going to be on the axis. That's the easiest, that's the way they line up, that's the lowest energy, that's the first bond. That's going to be called a sigma bond because it occurs on the axis. 
whereas the second bond that forms is going to occur outside of the axis. So let's find an example of that. Let's go back to that example. All right. This question asks us to determine the number of carbon to carbon sigma bonds and the total number of pi bonds in the compound thalidomide. Who has ever heard of thalidomide? You guys are getting younger and younger and less likely to remember. It affected the baby boomer generation most of all, but that was my parents' generation, so. Thalidomide was an anti-nausea pharmaceutical that was developed, and I think it was developed like in the 40s and 50s, and it was very, very effective at treating nausea. So one of the conditions that commonly causes nausea is pregnancy, early pregnancy. So this was prescribed, not so much in the US because we have the FDA, <laughs> who hadn't gotten a chance to test this guy yet, but more so in other countries, especially over in Europe, it was prescribed to a lot of pregnant women. And these pregnant women took this drug to combat the nausea, and it was this miracle drug that helped them with the nausea. The problem was, they didn't know in time, it causes extremely severe birth defects. Severe to the point where there were a large number of children in that generation who were, were born without limbs. They were not completely undeveloped limbs, all sorts of horrible birth defects, which is part of what drove a lot of the legislation that allows the FDA to have more control over what doctors can and cannot prescribe and how long you have to test a drug before it can go on the market, what kind of tests, all this. Um, thalidomide was one of the triggers behind that. So this is the structure for thalidomide. Now it looks kind of weird, doesn't it? What seems to be missing? I've got all these lines. What seems to be missing? Carbons or whatever is supposed to be here in this point of the line. So this is an organic molecule, meaning it's based on what two elements? Car carbon and hydrogen. Carbon and hydrogen, those are organic molecules. So when we draw organic molecules, they tend to get very big. As you can see, this is a whole lot bigger than the molecules we're dealing with. Lots of centers going on here. So rather than drawing in every individual atom, and we're using a Lewis structure, in organic modeling, we generally just make the assumption that unless otherwise noted, it's a carbon. And we know carbon always has to have how many bonds? Four. It's always got to have four bonds. So if the bond, the carbon looks like it has less than four bonds, it's assumed that the rest of those bonds are out to hydrogen. So if I were to redraw this in, let's draw this in, each one of these points here where we've got bonds coming out of, what's really there is a carbon. Carbon, 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 carbon. That's what's really going on here. Carbon, carbon. The other thing that is not shown is the hydrogens. So if I look, say, at this first carbon here, it's only got three bonds coming out of it, so it needs a fourth bond. That fourth bond is going out to hydrogen. Same here, hydrogen. 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 This carbon, these two carbons in the center already have four bonds. They're fine. This one needs a hydrogen. This one needs two hydrogens because it needs four bonds. I think I got them all. So that's what the structure actually looks like. That's a whole lot messier. Now this particular question asked, determine the number of carbon to carbon sigma bonds. So that means you don't have to worry about those hydrogens, but your homework is going to ask you for the total number of bonds. So that's why for this question, I'm actually going to ask you for the total number of sigma and pi's because that's more like what you're going to see on your homework, the total number of sigma and pi bonds. So everywhere there is a bond, you're going to have a sigma bond because that's the first bond on the axis. If you have a double bond, then the second bond there is going to be a pi bond. If you have a triple bond, both the second and the third are going to be pi. So let's make ourselves like a little cheat sheet right off the side. What is contained? Sigma and pi's. If I have a single bond, single bond, single bond, it is one sigma. If I have a double, it's got a sigma and a pi. If I have a triple, which we don't have in the structure, but if we did, 
It's got one sigma and two pi's. Does not like me writing off to the side like that. So there's our little cheat sheet table. With these large structures, it is very easy to miscount, either by skipping over a bond or counting twice. So I highly recommend writing this down on paper and then crossing them out, preferably in a different color, as you count them off. So you're less likely to count something twice or forget to count something. So everywhere I see a single bond, I'm going to count it as a sigma. Everywhere I see a double bond, I'm going to count one of them as sigma, one of them as pi. And if I saw a triple bond, I would count one of them as sigma and two of them as pi. So let's go around here. And I'm going to change colors here. And let's start counting off sigma bonds. I'll actually do it as a little sigma so you can see. Every single bond, let's do the single bonds first, is going to be a sigma. So let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. So I have twenty-three single bonds, which gives me twenty-three sigmas. sigmas. Now it's not my total sigmas, that's just the sigmas from the single bonds. We still have sigmas also from the double bonds. Now I'm going to go back and each one of those double bonds, I'm going to count the first one off as a sigma. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've got seven double bonds which is going to give me seven more sigmas. It's also, when I go back, going to give me a pi. The second bond is going to be a pi. So one, two, three, four, five, six, six pies. Right, did I? Which one did I miss? Right there, yeah. You're right. I think I hit seven. Seven pies. For a grand total of 30 sigmas and seven pies. Now, if you're looking at the answer in the textbook, of course, it's not going to have 30 sigmas because it was just asking you for the carbon to carbon sigma bonds, and we counted all of those sigma bonds because that's what it's going to ask you in your homework. In your homework, I can't remember, it was either the active ingredient aspirin or, or Tylenol that it gives you the structure for. So you're going to have to add in the hydrogens and the carbons to see where all the bonds are for that one. It's a little bit simpler. So we can practice this on a smaller thing real quick. All right. And I have no idea if this is a real structure or not. I just made this up. question is, in this structure, how many sigma bonds do I have and how many pi bonds do I have? So go ahead, write that down in your paper. 
and count up how many sigmas and pi's you have. After this, we'll have one more theory to go, and we're done with Chapter 9. I feel like we have an answer. Seven and three, good. Anybody not get those numbers or need to see which are the seven? What is two real quick? The sigmas, seven sigmas, so one, two, for every double again, the first one's gonna be sigma, three, four, five, for every triple, the first one's gonna be sigma, six and seven, there's my seven sigmas. Go back and do my pies now. One, two, three. There's my three pies. So while the one in your homework is a large complex structure, the one that's going to be on the test is going to be more like this one. And it will already have the hydrogens drawn in for you. How do we feel about pi bonds and sigma bonds? Can we count them? Good? Ready to move on? All right, let's move on to the last theory in Chapter 9. And that is molecular orbital theory. So valence bond theory was talking about the atomic orbitals overlapping. And hybridization was just an extension of that idea, that the atomic orbitals expand until they overlap and the electrons have access to both atomic orbitals. And that is a bond. That is a theory. So now this is a different theory. So one of the problems with that theory is it can't explain everything about bonding. And that's always the problem with these theories. They explain things, that some of them are harder, some of them are easier, but there's no one perfect theory that explains everything, which is why we have multiple theories of bonding. So one of the properties that valence bond theory and all the other theories we've talked about thus far failed to explain is magnetism. And no, I'm not talking about the magnets you play with that are made out of metals. This is not ferromagnetism. This is magnetism as it relates to molecular compounds. Yes, molecular compounds do have magnetic properties. So the two kinds of magnetic properties you see with molecular compounds are paramagnetic and diamagnetic. So a paramagnetic species is attracted to a magnetic field, whereas diamagnetic are repelled. Now, relatively weakly compared to what we play with with normal you know, ferromagnets, but there is some attraction and repulsion that can be observed. And this is a result of its electrons, the electron configuration. So 
So in order to be attracted to magnetic fields, you have to have unpaired electrons to be affected at all by that attraction. So in order to be paramagnetic, you need to have unpaired electrons. That's the big thing. You need unpaired electrons. Now, that's a problem because in Lewis theory, we were taught, with very few exceptions, free radicals being the only exception, you do not have unpaired electrons. They're always in pairs. They travel in pairs. They're a lone pair or they're a bond. Either way, they're always a pair. So magnetism, according to this, unless you're a free radical, which is incredibly unstable, you're not going to be paramagnetic. But the problem is we actually do observe this physical property in some species. So here is O2. Now oxygen at room temperature is what state of matter? A gas. But then again, so is nitrogen. Do we have liquid nitrogen? Yes, how do we make liquid nitrogen? Get it really, really cold. Also usually some pressure. Pressurize it, get it really, really cold. We can do the exact same thing to O2, oxygen, and get liquid oxygen. So I know the picture's a little bit fuzzy right here, but that's what's going on here is I've got liquid oxygen in this cylinder that's being poured between, this is a positive and negative pole, so that's a magnetic field. So it's being poured through the magnetic field. So these images might be a little bit clearer on page 405. It also shows liquid nitrogen on that same page. So O2, if I go off of the Lewis structure of O2, are there any unpaired electrons? No, so this should be diamagnetic. It should not be attracted. It should be repelled by this field. And I know it's kind of hard to see, but if you look closely, if you picture this as, as a liquid, clear liquid like water, it's actually getting pulled towards the magnets and kind of splashing outward towards them as it goes down. And if you look on page 405 at the N2, nitrogen, that goes straight through in a very narrow stream, narrow because it's getting repelled by the fields and trying to stay far away from them as possible, far away from those magnets as possible. So nitrogen displays diamagnetism, as we would expect, but oxygen displays this paramagnetism. It's attracted to these magnets. Why would it be attracted if it doesn't have a unpaired electron? So we, this is one of the properties that's not explained by any of the bonding theories we've dealt with so far, but it is going to be explained by molecular orbital theory. So molecular orbital theory is the idea of instead of having atomic orbitals, when things are about to bond, their orbitals are going to turn into a different kind of orbital called molecular orbitals. This is very similar to hybrid theory. In hybrid theory, we change the orbitals before we bond it to them. We change them up. This same thing. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to change those orbitals before we bond into them. Then the electrons are going to be, um, they're going to be existing in those new molecular orbitals. The difference is, in hybrid theory, the central atom provided all of the orbitals which were then hybridized before the bond started. In molecular orbital theory, the bond, orbitals are going to be provided by both atoms in the bond and then they're going to change into molecular orbitals and then the electrons are going to occupy those molecular orbitals. So let's see what it's going to look like. Let's start with something really small and simple. Hydrogen. Our simplest, smallest <coughs> molecule is H2 hydrogen. So according to here, we've got each of them has a 1s orbital. Now, in hybrid theory, the number of orbitals that goes into the hybridizing box is equal to the number of orbitals that comes out of the hybridizing box. Same is going to be true for molecular orbitals. The number of atomic orbitals that goes in is going to be equal to the number of molecular orbitals that comes out. So I put in two atomic orbitals, a 1s from each of these hydrogens. I'm going to get out two molecular orbitals. Change writing here. Each of this is a 1s. And 1s, those are the atomic orbitals. And here are going to be our molecular orbitals. So in this first image, it shows them separately. On the second image, it shows them overlapped on the same image. So in the case of, of hydrogen, and by the way, are this, is this bond going to be a sigma bond or a pi bond?
It'll be a sigma bond. Good. It occurs on the axis and it's the first bond that's formed. So this is going to be a sigma bond. So we're going to call this a sigma 1s bond or orbital. Sigma 1s because it is the orbital that makes a sigma bond. The other one is also making a sigma bond, but it's going to be called a sigma star bond 1s. Now, yes, that's just one orbital on the second image C there, but it just has two lobes, just like we have seen with P, bond, P orbitals and the pi bonds. It just has two lobes. This one is called a bonding molecular orbital. I'm going to put MO for molecular orbital, bonding molecular orbital. This is something called antibonding. Bonding orbitals occur in the space between, shared in between the atoms, while antibonding occurs outside of the space in between the two atoms. So just like a pi bond occurs above and below or in front of and behind outside of the axis of bonding, an antibonding orbital is going to occur outside of the shared area. It gets pulled outwards in the opposite directions of the bond, of the area where we would expect the bond to be which is why it's called antibonding. Now we can bond into antibonding orbitals, it's just higher in energy. So when I say higher in energy, here's what it looks like. Each hydrogen gives us a 1s orbital. Atom these are the atomic orbitals. Here's the molecular orbitals. These, we get the bonding orbital here, that's our sigma 1s. The sigma star 1s is our antibonding. This is increasing energy, which says that from these atomic orbitals down to the bonding orbital drops in energy, whereas up to the antibonding increases in energy. How do electrons feel about energy? Do they want to be at high energy or low energy? Low energy, which is why these electrons are more than happy to hop down into this low energy bonding orbital because it's lower in energy. So this kind of helps answer the question, well, why do things bond? Because it's lower in energy. But they're not going to want to jump up here because that's higher energy. So when we're looking at these, now these are going to be drawn for you, but when you're looking at these, the star, whenever you see a star next to any of these molecular orbitals, that means it is antibonding. That's what that star means, antibonding. Whereas if there is no star, like this one, this is a bonding orbital. So you draw your bonding and antibonding orbitals, and then you just fill in your electrons using the same rules we've been doing since chapter six. The electrons go into the lowest energy levels possible. They're going to be, if you have energy levels that are at the same, or sorry, multiple orbitals at the same energy levels, they're going to have one each before they pair up. Same rules we've been doing since chapter six. So this is H2. What about HE2? Dihelium. That we know isn't a thing. Hi, but why? Why doesn't helium form HE2? If I did the bonding and antibonding orbitals here, I would have to put electrons up there in the high energy antibonding orbital. And we're going to see in a while, in a minute here, how we can calculate whether or not a molecule will even occur. So just to show you that picture, we're going to go back to that in a second. We can use molecular orbital theory to calculate how stable a bond is by calculating something called the bond order. Yes, I know I said there weren't going to really be any calculations in chapter 9, but this one's a pretty small one. You shouldn't need to even grab a calculator for this one in most cases. So the bond order is equal to the number of electrons in bonding molecular orbitals minus the number in antibonding molecular orbitals, and then we're going to divide that thing by 2.
let's go back and see if we can determine what the bond order was for these two molecules. Let's do hydrogen first. So in hydrogen, if I wanted to determine what the bond order was, bond order, how many electrons are in bonding molecular orbitals for H2? This is our bonding orbital. There's our two electrons, two. How many are in antibonding? Zero. So what is our bond order here going to be? One. So that's your bond order for H2. One. So would that just say in the bonding orbital, like if there was more um, electrons that didn't fit the bonding orbital, it would make the bond that was the bonding orbital? Exactly. Just like we see in H2. We ran out of space in the bonding orbital, so it had to jump up into the anti-bonding orbitals. So let's determine the bond order for this guy. How many electrons are in bonding orbitals for HE2? Two. There's our two bonding. How many are in anti-bonding? Two. So what is our bond order here? Zero. That means zero stability. So would this thing occur if it has zero stability? <coughs> no. The higher the bond order, the more stable the molecule. So we want that bond order as high as possible if we're trying to make stable bonds. Let's look at lithium-2 versus beryllium-2. So same problem as hydrogen and helium, just on the second row. So that's going to look exactly the same, except for here we're going to have, sorry, it's just going to be 2s. So sigma 2s, sigma star 2s. Lithium is in the same family as helium, so it's going to look the same thing. It's just we're going to replace these 1s's with 2s's. Beryllium is in the second family. It has the same number of valence electrons as helium, 2. Again, it's just in the 2s instead of the 1s. So according to this, lithium-2 with a bond order of 1 is stable, whereas beryllium-2 with a bond order of 0 does not exist. So we're going to use molecular orbital to predict what kinds of things will exist or compare and say which one's going to be a more stable molecule. So this, you can also have bonding and antibondings in the p orbitals. So let's look at what bonding and antibonding looks like in the p orbitals. Don't go, worry. You're not going to have to recognize the pictures. So here's our p orbitals. We've got the p along the y-axis, the p along the x-axis, and the p along the z-axis. So I'm going to come in. I'm going to form the first bond between these two p orbitals along the x-axis. Is that going to be a sigma or a pi? Sigma, good. It's along the axis is going to be a sigma. So here's my two atomic orbitals, and let's call these both 2s's. 2s, or sorry, 2p's. 2px and 2px. I put two atomic orbitals in. I expect two molecular orbitals out. So this is going to be sigma. 2px is going to be our bonding, which looks like this. That's our sigma 2px. Change colors. That's our bonding orbital. Our antibonding orbitals, again, most of antibonding occurs on the outside of the bond, so that's going to be our antibonding with two lobes. And that's going to be our sigma star 2px. Again, the star means <coughs> antibonding. So there's the two lobes of the antibonding orbital. Now I've still got two more p orbitals that I can put in here. I've got the one along the y, and I've got the one along the z. But are those going to form sigma bonds? No, those are going to form what bonds? Pi's. So what does that look like? So here is the pi along the y is going to form these two 
molecular orbitals. So two atomic orbitals. I'm going to have an anti-bonding one that pulls away and a bonding one that occurs in the place we would expect a normal pi orbital to occur. Exact same thing happens with the one along the z-axis, except that it's turned on its side. Instead of being up and down, it's coming straight out at you. So that's the images here. So that's what all those orbitals look like. Again, you're not going to have to recognize them. You're just going to have to be able to identify them from the orbital diagrams. So back to these orbital diagrams. Now, I'm only going to ask you about things that occur on the second period because your textbook has already provided you with all of those orbitals. So these are already provided for you. All you have to do is fill in the electrons. So this image is on the bottom of page 404, and it shows the relative energies of these orbitals, which are actually different for oxygen and fluorine versus everything else in the second period. So if you're looking at this for oxygen and fluorine, the sigma 2p is actually lower in energy than the pi's. Where over here, lithium, boron, carbon, and nitrogen, that sigma is higher in energy. So that's what's swapped here. These swapped places. So make sure you're using the right one. If, you're, if, give you, if I give you oxygen or fluorine, use this arrangement. If I give you lithium, boron, carbon, and nitrogen, use this arrangement. So let's fill these things in. Let's say I want to fill it in for O2. Let's do O2 first. O2. Each oxygen has how many valence electrons? Six. So in the O2 molecule, how many valence electrons do I have? Twelve. So I've got twelve electrons. I'm going to fill in these electrons using the same rules we've been doing since chapter six. Start at the bottom, we'll work our way up. So how many goes into this first orbital here? Two. Now I'm down to 10 left. What goes in the next orbital? Two. Next orbital. Two, I'm up to six. Next orbital. Keep going. Four. So each one gets two. One, two, three, four. How many have two now? 10, how many electrons do I have left? Two. Two. So are they both going to go into the same thing here? No. One each. Am I done? Yes, I'm done. Now here's what's so important about this. Where's my pen? There it is. I'll circle it right here. What are those things? Those are unpaired electrons. If I have unpaired electrons, what kind of magnetic properties would I expect? Good, paramagnetic. Which is what we observed with oxygen was that it was paramagnetic. It was attracted to those magnets. So molecular orbital theory explains magnetism that was not explained by Lewis theory or valence bond theory or hybrid theory or Vesper theory. None of them could explain how on earth there are unpaired electrons in oxygen when it looks like there aren't. If you do molecular orbital theory, there are unpaired electrons. So it would be paramagnetic. Now here's more good news for you guys. I told you I'd only give you one of these molecules. It's going to be one of them from the second period. Look right there. There they are, already filled in for you. This image is on page 405. It has it already filled in. It tells you details like whether it's paramagnetic or diamagnetic, what the bond order is. It also gives us details about bond length. Why do we care about bond length and what does it have to do with here, with this? We already said that the higher the bond order, here, higher BO, bond order, equals more stable bond. If the bond is more stable, do you think that the atoms are closer or farther apart? Closer, good. Atoms are closer, which means the bond length is what? Shorter, good. Bond length is shorter. Ooh, there we go, shorter. 
So if you look at this, say, if we're comparing carbon versus nitrogen, carbon has a bond order of 2 and a bond length of 131, whereas nitrogen has a bond order of 3, which is a higher number, and a bond length of 110. So it got shorter as the bond order increased. So these are questions I could ask you to see if you understand is which one would have the longer bond length. Then you have to determine the bond order. Now again, well, what's the catch if I've already given you both the bond order and the bond lengths? I'm going to ask you for ions. What changes with these things when I make them ions? Electrons, I add or remove electrons. So I'm going to ask you, what is it for some sort of an ion? So let's say, which one do we do here? Let's do O2, 2 minus. Let's go back to our image. So we already drew it for O2 there. I'm going to erase it, and I'm going to do it for O2, 2 minus. All right, so let's do O2, 2 minus now. What's going to change about my number of electrons for O2, 2 minus? Add 2, so I'm going to have how many? 14 electrons. So I'm going to do the same thing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right. All right. Am I still paramagnetic? No, I'm not diamagnetic. And that green is not showing up well. Something you'd see in a color blindness test. Do you see the electrons? This is now diamagnetic. Also, the bond order has changed. Let's calculate the bond order of this real quick. Bond order. So, how many electrons are in bonding orbitals? Remember, how, if I'm just looking at this, how do I tell by the labels whether or not it's bonding or antibonding? Star, the asterisk. The asterisk means is what? Antibonding. All right, so let's circle all of our bonding orbitals first. Two, four, six, eight. So I should have eight electrons in bonding orbitals. How many in antibonding then? Six. So eight minus six divided by two. What is my bond order for O2, two minus? One. So the bond order is one. Compared to what it was when it's just plain old O2, when it's just plain old O2 here, it had a bond order of two. So if I'm comparing O2 versus O2, two minus, which one would have a longer bond, O2 or O2, two minus? O2 has a bond order of two while the O2, 2 minus has a bond order of 1. Would have a longer or shorter? Good, shorter, because bond order being smaller means less stable, which means that the bond length is what? Long. Longer, good. Longer bond length. So for E on the end. Or O2, 2 minus has a longer bond length than O2. So that's what you need to do for this section. And again, I'm only going to give you one of these, but I'm going to give you, ask you to compare it to an ion. Now, if it was O2 positive, then I would do what to the number of electrons? Subtract 1. Good. So just going off of this chart, be able to add or subtract however many electrons I ask you for. That is molecular orbital theory. Any questions about molecular orbital theory? Yes. 